Thanks so much for joining us. You're about to hear a message from our youth and young adult gathering Unite with special guest Pastor Dan Blythe from Hillsong London. We know this message is going to impact your life, so get ready to be challenged and inspired. So excited to be here today. I just want to thank Caleb and Adam and all the team for having us. Who's thankful for your leaders here tonight? I said, who's thankful for your leaders here? Make this your reality. You guys are phenomenal, and I love that we're starting to build a relationship with you guys. I've also brought three friends with me. Why don't you boys stand up? This is Charlie, Jordan, and JC. Mixed reaction. I don't know, were you judging like their style there or how good looking they were? Uh, all three of them are single, by the way. They, um, they asked me to say that, so um, maybe um, you can just wave at them afterwards. Hey, um, tonight I want to share a message which actually links into what Caleb was talking about. I love how at the beginning he talked about courage. Nelson Mandela says, courage is not the absence of fear, but the triumph over it. The brave man is not he who does not feel afraid, but he who conquers that fear. I believe tonight, I don't know what fears you walked in with, but I do believe you're going to walk out fearing less. And you might have all sorts of fears that you've carried around with you day after day, month after month, year, year after year. But tonight, I believe that tonight he's going to set you free and you're going to walk out of here different to when you came in here. Anyone expectant tonight? So this message is called Fearless Praise. Fearless Praise, got a screen, made it, keynote myself. Thanks very much. Uh, fearless Praise and you might be wondering what fearless praise looks like. Well, I was scrolling through Instagram and I found this little vine. This is what I think fearless praise might look like. Man, look at this dude over here praising God, man. Hey, what's up? What's up? Hey, let me holler at you, my man. Book of Revelation. You heard that new Kurt Franklin? Verses 16 and 17. What? Yes, sir. You heard that new Kurt Franklin? Who's up for giving God some fearless praise tonight? Can you imagine what tonight would look like if we had no fear? If we didn't care what people thought, if we didn't care what people said, but we just praise God like we're in heaven already? Man, this meeting will look dramatically and drastically different. And tonight, I believe by the end of the service, something will change, which will change this place forever. But I believe it's the Bible that's going to show us how to get there. I would love to say that this message came from a place of strength, but it didn't. It came from a place of weakness. But I've realized that actually, if you allow God to use your weakness, it can be a blessing to not only you, but the friends and family around you. And actually, it can be a testimony which gives him the praise and gives him the glory. And when the praises go up, the blessings come down. <laughs> but I remember about three years ago now, we had youth on a Friday night. We had young adults on a Saturday. And we had four services on a Sunday. I sung 42 worship songs that weekend. The last service had a kick-out song which goes, Your love is relentless. Well, as good as that song is, in my head, I'm like, this song is relentless. Like, I was just over it. I was just going through the motions. I didn't think anyone had noticed. So I'm driving in my car, and my wife, Charlie, she turns to me, and she goes, babe, babe, can I ask you a question? Now, when my wife asks me, she can ask me the question. It's normally one of two things. Either I've done something wrong, and she wants to address it, or she wants some money. <laughs> so I'm like, yes, babe, what is it? She goes, in that last service, you were lifting your hands. I said, yes, I was. She said, you were singing the song. I said, yes, I was. She said, you look the part and you sound the part, but was there actually anything going on at all in your heart? And the moment she said it, hit me with a ton of bricks, because if there's anyone that I want to lead and inspire in my life, it's my wife. But yet she had seen that I'd let religion get into my relationship. She, I'd let tradition, I'd let going through the motions enter my relationship with Jesus Christ. And I made a decision right there. Never again will I waste a single song in praise and worship. But I'll get to the nucleus, the centerpiece, the cornerstone of what praise is all about. And I will never hold back, but I'll give him everything with all that I have. So as I started to research, I found out that this one word, praise, has several different Hebrew words in the Old Testament. Yauda, Tauda, Balak, Halal, Shabak, Samar, and Tehillah. And I'm going to teach you these tonight. 
So when you get home and your mum says or your dad says or your friend says, hey, how was youth and young adults tonight? What did you learn? You can say, what did I learn? I learned Hebrew. Shalom. <laughs> All right. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are so, so consistent with your love and your grace and your mercy and your forgiveness and your freedom. And Father, I thank you that tonight we've not come here just to be entertained. We haven't come here because we haven't got anything else to do on a Friday night. We've come here expecting because we believe actually tonight you're going to change things. And as awkward as that might feel in the moment, we pray today, we pray today that we'll push through any uncomfortableness, we'll push through any awkwardness so we can live the life that you've called us to live, a life without fear. Amen. If you're taking notes, take notes. If you don't take notes because you don't do that, that's fine. I've made more screens for you so you can screenshot this. So just in case you want to come back to this reference later on, this is for you. First one is Yada coming up on the screen right now. Yada. Everyone say Yada. Yada. This means praise with extended hands. It means thanksgiving. It means you know God is a good God and a loving God. Therefore, you praise him and thank him. And while you do, you lift your hands at the same time. Yet our praise is a response. Who went to bed last night? Give me a wave. Oh, some of you stayed up all night. Rebels. <laughs> the reason you went to bed last night was not because of your bedtime. It was actually because you're responding to something, and that something is tiredness. Who had breakfast this morning? Give me a wave. Good. Most important meal of the day. My favorite is Pop-Tarts. You know, I like Pop-Tarts. Um, they're coming back. They're making a way back. We need to make room for Pop-Tarts. The reason you had breakfast is not because it's your breakfast time. It's actually because you're responding to something, and that something is hunger. I want to put it to you that the reason we praise God on a Friday night is not because it is 7.30, and that's the time we praise. It's actually because we're responding to something, and that something is grace. For we have been saved and set free. That is why we praise Him. Can I, let's just make sure we understand that we're all on the same level here. Has anyone ever told a lie? Give me a wave. If you're not waving, you're lying. <laughs> We have all told a lie. Has anyone ever stolen anything? I'm talking about the pen from the bank. I'm talking about your friend's hoodie that you never gave back. I'm talking about Independence Day DVD that you've had five years. Yeah, we've all stolen something. Or well, anyone ever had a lustful thought? Lustful thought. Yeah, I didn't say put your hand out for that one. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> we have all told a lie. We have all stolen something, and we've all had a last four thought. Guess what? We are all not perfect, but we are all saved by grace. That means we can all walk in here knowing that it's not what we have done, but it's what he has done. I love standing next to new Christians in church because they put both hands in the air like they just don't care. They praise him with tears of joy streaming down their face. Do you know why? Because they just received this grace and this love and this mercy, this forgiveness and some freedom that only responds is to praise him with extended hands. If you feel like you become numb to praise, desensitized to praise, if you feel like you're just going through the motions like I was, I want to encourage you. Remember the day you got saved. Remember the day you got baptized. Remember the great work God is doing in you and is still doing in you today. Because grace is not a concept. It's not a theology. Grace is a person, and his name is Jesus Christ. If there's anyone who's grateful for grace, why don't you go ahead and give him some yada praise in the house today. He is worthy of our praise. He's worthy. Now, the first time we find Yada praise in the Bible is in Genesis 29, verses 35. Now, just to set the scene, there is two sisters. One of them is called Rachel, and the other is called Leah. Now, the Bible says that Rachel is beautiful and shapely, oh la la, and Leah, not so much. It says Leah has dull eyes. What the Bible is saying is that Rachel is like Real Madrid FC. Leah is like Scunthorpe United. Like, like th there's a difference. Like, Rachel is like West Brom. Any West Brom fans? Leah is like Wolves? Got any Wolves fans? Okay, okay. Rachel's like Ferrari. Anyone want a Ferrari? Yeah, Rachel's like Ferrari. Leah's like a Fiat Panda, right? There's, 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 a, diff there's a difference there. Rachel's like Ralph Lauren. Leah's like Primark. Like, like, it's different. I know, I know. It does not sound fair, but it's biblical. Read the Bible. Read the Bible. Rachel is like Waitrose. Rachel's is like where all the posh people shop. I got one opposite me. They come out, they finish their shopping. They don't even get the quid back. They're that rich. They're like, yeah, I don't care. I'm fine. I, I can live without it. Rachel is like Waitrose. Leah is like Little. Anyone like Little? Come on, come on. I love Little. You can. You might not get what you went in for, but you can get pe penguins, wagon wheels, 9.99. Happy days. There's a difference. Anyway, there's a single guy called Jacob. 
He's walking around, single, ready to mingle. He's in praise and worship, and he looks to his left, and there he sees none other than Rachel. Ow, ow, ow. He likes what he sees. So he moves over, throws some worship shapes, flexing the guns at the same time, trying to impress her. And when he gets to her, he says, what's your name? She says, Rachel. He goes on Facebook. He stalks her. He finds her. She's single. Happy days. Then he lays down his best chatter blinds. He says, you know what material this is? Husband material. She wasn't interested. He goes, do you work for Google? Because you're the one I've been searching for. I know you can write it down if you want, but it still wasn't working for him at the time. He goes, you can email me if you want, jacob at hotmail.com. <laughs> anyway, she wasn't buying into them at all, so he thought, I'd better throw down my Christian chat-up lines. So he threw down the first one. He goes, is it hot in here? Is that the Holy Spirit burning inside of you? Come on, come on, that's a good one. That's good. They said, now I know why Solomon had 700 wives, because he never met you. It's getting harder. And then he goes, do you know why we should date? Because I like my girls, like my Microsoft Word documents. Saved. Hey. hey. Do you get it? Saved. I know some of you are like, oh, hey. Anyway, they start dating. It's getting official. They both change their relationship status on Facebook at the same time. So it's not awkward with one person doing it and not the other. It's official. Now, after a while, he wants to get married to her. So he says, can I marry you? She says, oh, I would love to marry you, Jacob, but you need to ask my dad, Laban, for permission. He goes, I will do that. So he goes to Laban. He says, hey, I've been dating your daughter for a while now. Well done. Amazing genes. She is fantastic. Can I marry her? He says, you can, but you have to work for me for seven years. Seven years. Single lads in the house, who would work for seven years to get the love of your life? Give me a wave. Who wouldn't? Who wouldn't? Oh, one of you, two of you. Yeah, you're going to be single for a long time. <laughs> long time. You've got to put in the effort. He works for seven years. At the end of the seven years, it is his wedding day. Now, he's got a nice suntan because he had his stag do in Prague. He's got a nice skinny fit Zara suit like he's ready. And in she walks. Bum, bum, ba da You've got the same one in Dudley. Anyway, down she walks. Now, back in the day... The wedding attire was a little bit different. It used to cover the head and the body. So you can't actually see who's walking down the aisle. Now Laban has switched the daughters, and it is not Rachel, the one he wants walking down the aisle. It is, in fact, Leah, the wrong sister. Whoever says the Bible is boring is definitely not reading this thing, because this is amazing. He goes through with the vows. I do, I do, I do. Not only that, he spends the wedding night with her. Uh-huh, honey, the wedding night with her. How you do that without realizing, I do not know. But he wakes up the next morning, stretches his arms. Ugh. What the? No. That's the wrong sister. Anyway, <laughs> takes out Instagram. Hashtag shocked. Hashtag father-in-law did me over. He can't believe the whole thing. It is not the sister that he ordered. He goes up to Laban. He's like, Laban, what's this about? You know, I've worked for seven years for Rachel. You're giving me Leah. He's like, hey, he got you. But you are married to her, so this is the deal. You work for another seven years, and you can have both, two wives. And this is exactly where the problem started, because now Jacob is married to Rachel and Leah, and we know that he loves Rachel and not Leah. But God starts to bless Leah, because Leah is in this place of being rejected, rejected and abandoned. He blesses her with babies. She has Reuben then Simeon, then Levi, and the fourth baby she calls Judah. And this is where we find Yadar praise. In Genesis 29, verses 35, it says, Once again she became pregnant with another son. She called him Judah, for she said, Now I will praise Yadar, the Lord. What Leah is saying is this, I have been rejected by man, but I have not been rejected by my maker. I have been abandoned by my husband, but my Father in heaven has never left me. He's seen me in my rejected place, and he has blessed me, so I will thank him for who he is and what he has done. Yada praise is about being aware of the blessings that you have. Your friends, your family, the roof over your head, the food on the table, this church that you have, this youth ministry, this Friday night that we have, and the salvation that we have received. Can you imagine if you woke up tomorrow with only the things that you thank God for today? Wouldn't that change the way you praise? Do you know what I really love? 
From Judah came the tribe of Judah. From the tribe of Judah came King David. From the line of King David came Jesus Christ. And he showed us how to truly praise. It was about rules, religion, regulations, do this and do that. It was simply about following him. He went to the cross. He made a way. He died and he rose again because he is victorious. We are victorious because he is triumphant. We are triumphant. He went up to heaven and sent the Holy Spirit in Acts 2, the day of Pentecost. Since that day, the church has been full of the Holy Spirit, and we are full of the Holy Spirit today. So when we praise him and we sing that song with everything, we are giving him yet our praise, which means we are connected through to the very first book of the Bible, which tells me that this book is not a dead book, it's not a dormant book, it's not a distant book, it's alive when we give him some praise. So come on, give him some yet our praise right now. This is, this is it right here. We're bringing the Bible alive. Yada. Now, the next one's a little bit, little bit harder. It's called Tauda. Everyone say Tauda. That's good. Someone just said it like it's actually pronounced like, like anyway, I'm not going to do it. It's really awkward. But yeah, it's actually pronounced like your um, Tauda. That's actually how it's pronounced. I listened to the audio when I was doing my research. Anyway, moving on. This means a sacrifice of thanks. It means you praise him even when you don't feel like praising him. When you're struggling with depression, when you just failed the exam, when you just got dumped by your boyfriend and girlfriend, when your parents are going through divorce, when someone in your family has been diagnosed with cancer, when you have suicidal thoughts, when you're getting bullied, when you've got an eating disorder, when you're in a situation and circumstance, and you don't feel like praising, but you make a decision to praise him anyway, because you know he is greater than your problem, he is stronger than your situation, this is how to praise, and I want to tell you, it is the most powerful way to praise. It says this in Psalm 56, verses 12. I'll fulfill my vows to you, O God, and I'll offer a sacrifice of thanks, Tauda, for your help. See, there's two times to praise. When you feel like it, and when you don't. Yauda and Tauda. See, the moment you stop giving him Tauda praise, you take your eyes off the problem, and then you fix your focus on the situation, and you try and fix it in your own strength. Sometimes with bad relationships, sometimes with alcohol, sometimes with uh, drugs, whatever. We do all that we can to numb the pain and hide the pain. But God never wanted you to live with the pain. He wanted to set you free from the pain. That's why he's your healer. That's why he's your savior. And when you give him Tawdah praise, you're giving him access into the situation so he can do what only he can do. There was a terrorist attack in Paris which happened a couple of years back. I'm good friends with the youth pastor there. And he said, Dan, all of Paris is full of fear. They don't want to leave the house. Everyone's staying at home. So we're going to cancel youth. We're not going to have Friday night youth. I said, mate, you go ahead. You do whatever you need to do. Then he called me back and he said, hey, Dan, actually, we're having youth on Friday. Because when the word got out, the youth heard. And when the youth heard that we weren't doing uh, youth because of the terrorist attack, they said, we're not going to hide away in fear. We're going to meet together and praise. We're going to meet together and pray to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. That night... All of Paris was in fear, apart from this little youth ministry, which joined together and lifted up the name of Jesus Christ. They said it was the most powerful night they've ever had. They walked out of that place not fearing man, but fearing God. You see, fear of God is not a negative, it's a positive. It means you have an awe, a reverence, an understanding of how good and how great he is. Fear of God is the antidote to fear of man. And when you start understanding how good and how great and how powerful he is, you do not fear the situations around you. This is why Tauda praise is so significant. You might not feel like praising today. You might be there with your hands in your pockets. You're like, Dan, you don't know what week I've had. You don't know what I'm going through. Dan, if you knew my situation, you wouldn't want to praise either. You know what? Your situation and your circumstance gives you every right to do what you want to do. But I do want to tell you, when you start dictating to your feelings rather than letting your feelings dictate to you who he is, your feelings will change. And even though you might be in a situation which is like a dark valley, tonight is not about walking to the dark valley. It's about walking through it. And when you start to lift up the name of Jesus Christ, the name Jesus means he saves, I guarantee you, he will give you a peace. He will give you a comfort. He'll do something on the inside out that even though your situation might not change in the moment, you will know that you'll be able to handle it because the power on the inside of you is much greater than anything in front of you. Tauda praise. So powerful. Yauda, Tauda, and the next one is Barak. Well easy to remember, Barak, Obama. It means to kneel, to bow, and to serve. It says in Psalm 95, verse 6, come. Let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. Like you can kneel before God in its amazing posture. But you know, the posture of praise isn't meant to be just for a moment. It's not just meant to be for 20 minutes on a Friday night. It's meant to be our lifestyle. 
See, this is talking about a lifestyle of humility. It's talking about a lifestyle of servanthood. It's a lifestyle of surrender. It's a lifestyle of God first. Do you want to know if God's first in your life? You start serving the people on your left and your right. See, when you love God and you start praising him, the natural consequence, the result, is that you start loving people and caring for people. What this means is that to praise him, you don't need to be able to sing in tune. You don't need to be able to play an instrument. All you need to do is be able to serve one another. When you go out into Dudley and you help the broken, the bad, the hurting, the lost, the rejected, and the neglected, and you help them, you might not be singing a note, but you are praising because you're giving glory to the Father. It means the team that got in here nice and early to set up so that you could come tonight. They might not be part of the worship team, but they were praising because they were serving you so that you could come and hear a message of grace that was going to encourage you to hear today. I want to put it to you that Dudley does not need a new definition of Christianity. It needs a new demonstration of Christianity. And that comes from all of us saying, no longer I, but Christ that lives in me. I'm going to serve people and I'm going to praise God. And that's how I'm going to live a lifestyle of Barak praise. Yaura tauda Barak. And I love this next one, halal. It's where we get the word hallelujah. And this is where it starts getting a little bit crazy. Like us English don't really like this one. It means to boast, to shine, to be clamorously foolish. The word clamorously means all eyes are looking at you. And the word foolish means foolish. It means you dance like David danced, unashamed and undignified, and you don't care what anyone thinks. You don't care what anyone says. All you care about is praising the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. When Caleb said, if you want prayer tonight, come forward here. And he was talking about courage. And a group of people came down. Now, there might have been some of you which were like, I want to go down. I feel in my heart I want to go down, but actually I'm not going to because I'm aware that people around me might not think it's cool or they might think something of me. And because of that, you've stayed where you are in what's called your comfort zone. That's fine, but I want to put it to you, you never achieve anything in your comfort zone. Everything God has for you is on the other side of fear. And when you start to praise him with halal praise, you lose the fear of man as you continue to grow in your fear of God. I would love to say that I've been killing it in this area ever since I got saved. But that would be a lie. I got saved when I was 18, and for the first five years, I was always the kid at the back. I was always the kid with my hands in my pockets. Like Maybe if it was a banger, if it was like Cornerstone, I'd put, I'd put one hand in the air, but maybe not two. Like Two was like crazy. Like It was a bit where everyone was singing. But for me, I was always very conscious about what people might think, very conscious about what people might say. But then I just had this simple revelation that when it comes to the call of God, he's not looking for cooler, slicker, smoother people in church. He's looking for unashamed, undignified generation who will stand up and rise up and go out when he says go. Here's the thing. It says this in Psalm 150. Hallelujah. Praise halal God in his holy house of worship. Praise him under the open skies. Praise him for his acts of power. Praise him for his magnificent greatness. Praise him in his holy house. Today we are gathering, and because we are gathering, we are in his house. Here's the truth. If you cannot be unashamed in the house, you will never be unashamed outside of the house. If you cannot get over your fear in here, you will never get over your fear out there. See, sometimes we pray these ridiculous, crazy, amazing, audacious dreams. God, send me. I want to see my school turned upside down. I want to see my university transformed for you. But the truth is, if you can't respond to a simple altar call, if you can't put your hands in the air, if you can't lose the fear of man in here, you will never, ever lose it out here. This is a place where you can let go of the fear of man because like Caleb said, this is your home, this is your family, this is your community. This is a place where you can take off the mask, stop trying to be something that you're not and be who God has called you to be and be bold, confident and courageous in that fact. Fear will hold you back from giving him halal praise. I'll tell you what else will. This word reserved. Us English are reserved. The word reserved means held back for another purpose. I grew up, used to love David Beckham. I had nearly every single one of his haircuts. I'm unashamed. I'm happy to admit that. But when he would run, I looked at his stats, he would run in an England game about seven miles per game. He would never, ever, ever run a marathon in the morning. Do you know why he would not run a marathon in the morning before the game? Because he is reserving himself. He is holding back for another purpose so that he can play his best in the game in the evening. Here's the thing. As Christians, we are meant to be reserved. But we're not meant to be reserved in here. We're meant to be reserved out there. See, when you go back to your school, when you go back to your university, when you go back to your friends and your family, and people are belittling people, gossiping about people, hurting people, manipulating people, that's when you reserve yourself. 
Not to cast judgment on that, but to bring the love and light of Jesus Christ in that situation. We are meant to be reserved when we're outside the house. But I want to ask you, what other purpose is there than to give him all the glory? This is the one place in your whole week where you should be able to come to youth, let your hair down, let your weave down, have a pie like no other pie, and celebrate the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. This is the place where we overcome the fear of man. This is the place. You know, Dudley might have had some great parties. I saw some like Peaky Blinders party. Everyone's dressed up on the way here. You might have some great nightclubs. You might have some great parties going on. But I want to put it to you. From this day forward, I believe the loudest, craziest, most ridiculous parties in the whole of Dudley should be right here in the house of God. Because what we worship and what we celebrate, it is not seasonal. It is not eternal. We don't need no drugs or alcohol to get the mood going. We've already received the joy of the Lord. And that is more than enough for us to celebrate. What would it look like today if we turn this into a proper party and we just lost the fear of man and we started praising God? Because, you know, when you get to heaven, there's going to be no one with hands in their pockets. When you get to heaven, there's not going to be no one like standing around going, oh, no, nah, I don't like this song. When you get to heaven, there's going to be like, oh, no, nah, I'm just hanging out with my mates. I'm not, I'm not into this moment. Heaven's going to be a 24-7 praise party. So my question is, well, tonight, why don't we just bring heaven down to earth and have a party right here? You ever been to a wedding? The first person on the dance floor is not the bride and groom. It is the kids. The kids just walk up there, and the music's just tired. They're throwing some shapes, but it's all like, it doesn't work. It's not in time, but they don't care. Why? Because they have not yet developed the fear of man. It's funny how Jesus says that we're meant to be like children. I believe that's what our praise and worship should be like, a place where we really just do not care, but we praise him with all that we have. That is halal praise. Yawda ta'ala balak halal Oh, yeah, number five is Shabak. I want to say Shabak. It's got a proper spray at the end of it. Shabak. It means to address God with a loud voice. It means to give him a shout of praise. If you can't do halal, don't even try and do Shabak because this is a step up. All the way through the Bible, what you find is that a shout of praise is a physical act, but it has a supernatural impact. Walls come down, chains are broken, and people are set free. It says this in Psalm 47, verse 1. It says, Come, everyone, clap your hands. Shout to God with joyful praise, Shabbat, for the Lord Most High is awesome. He is the great King of all the earth. See, a shout of praise, what it does, it unites us, and it lifts us above our differences. It lifts us above any unforgiveness, any hate, any negativity, and it unites us under the name of Jesus Christ, and it prepares us for what he has in front of us. Maybe Caleb's up here sometimes. He's like, Come on, let's give God a shout of praise. So maybe some of you are into it, maybe some of you aren't. But I want to put it to you that he's not trying to hype the service. You cannot hype God. Hype means to extravagantly exaggerate someone or something. You can hype an event, you can hype a person, but you cannot hype God. Because no matter what you say about him, it doesn't even come close to how good and to how great he is. A shout of praise is not hype. A shout of praise is a part of praise that will set you free. I remember when I was 15 years old. Watch this movie with Mel Gibbs in. It's called Braveheart. Anyone ever seen Braveheart? I mean, I know it's old, and I know I'm showing my age, but, like, best movie ever. There's this scene where he's got, like, the Scottish army lined up. They've all got blue paint on their, on their face, got massive swords, hench muscles. They're ready to go. And then the English army is on the other side. Now, he gives them this massive speech. He says, Scotland, are you ready? Are you ready to step into this epic battle and, at the end of that, step into some freedom? Do you know what their response is? They go, rah! They all give a massive shout together. And in that massive shout, fear disappears because they realize they're not standing alone. They're standing with an army and they're going to go forward together. But can you imagine if there was just one lad? One lad, hand in his pocket. Everyone's shouting, not him. He's like, oh, sorry, William. I'm, I'm an introvert. I'm just, I'm, I'm not really a shouter. Like, you know, I'm a little bit melancholy. Like, I just don't, I don't shout. William Wallace would walk up to him and say, mate, this isn't about whether you're extrovert or introvert. This isn't about whether you're loud or quiet. This isn't about whether you feel like shouting. This is about are you with us or not with us because we're going somewhere and we're shouting because we're preparing for what is ahead. This is why we give God a shout of praise. I'm not a shouter. Even when my favorite football team, Chelsea, scores. Anyway. When, when they score, I'm like, yes. I'm not a shouter. But in church, when there's an opportunity to lift my voice to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, I will never hold back. I will give him everything because I never, ever want to miss out on what God wants to do in that moment. 
There is power in a shout of praise. And maybe you've never given God a shout of praise in your whole life. I believe that tonight, if you do, just lift your voice. You will find change will break and you will be set free from so many things in your life. Because in that moment of you stepping out of your comfort zone, you're stepping into the God zone and everything is changing. Yada Tauda Balak, Shabak, Zamar. Yada Tauda Halal Shabak, Zamar. Number five is Zamar. Going to invite the worship team to join me because this is where the music comes in. It even sounds musical. Zamar. Girls, help me out. Sing Zamar. One, two, three. Boys, one, two, three. That's, that's, that's what I like that. I like that. I like that. Zamar. This is where the music accompanies the praise. Let me read this psalm to you. Psalm 147, verse 7 says, Sing to the Lord with grateful praise. Make music, Zamar, to our God on the harp. Now, we don't have a harp here, but we've got a lot of different instruments. It says, grateful praise, and then the instrument. There's a, there's a real pattern here, and you've got to get it. Grateful praise, yauda and tauda, and then the instrument. It doesn't say play the instrument, and when the music is so good, when the melody is just how you like it, when you're really into the vibe of the music, then praise. No, it says praise first. What this is clearly saying is that our praise today is not meant to be here led by them. In fact, this is just our backing band. The praise of Zamar is led here by us with Yauda and Tauda, and the music just accompanies our praise. There should never be a day where the worship leader is up here sweating, just praying in his head going, please, Lord, can they praise today? No, no, it should be the other way around. We should be in here nice and early. Oi, drummer, chop, chop. I'm ready to praise today. Hey, that keyboard person. Yeah, yeah, let's go. Let's go. I'm ready to praise today. Let's never let the melody, let's never, never let the, the instruments dictate our praise. Like, like, this is old already. Like, at the moment, it's DJs. Like, who knows what praise and worship will look like in 20 years? We might be wearing 3D glasses. We might be playing it on our apps. Like, it doesn't matter what the style is. All it is is about is us giving glory to him, the king, from our heart. So never let the style dictate your praise today. Never let the, the day of the week, never let the who's leading worship. It's all about you. Today, we could have the most amazing praise and worship experience. And it has nothing to do with the preacher. It has nothing to do with the worship team. It has nothing to do with the event. It's everything to do with you. Would you go all in? And would you praise him with everything? Because the final one is Tehila. Everyone say Tehila. Say it like a Mexican. Tehila. Tehila. Now this is every single thing that I've just spoken about in one. It means to sing halals, to sing, to dance, to clap, to have a party like no other party. This is one of the most powerful ways to praise. It says this in Psalm 100 verses 4. It says, enter into his gates with thanksgiving. Thanksgiving, yada and tauda, but enter into his courts with praise, tehillah. Into his courts, which means there's an inner place, a deeper place where God dwells and God inhabits. It says, give thanks to him and praise his name, for the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. It starts with thanksgiving. That is the entry place to his presence. And his presence is power. But there's another place where you truly access God. And this is when you start to give him to heal a praise. Now, some of you might have already given God to heal a praise. And when you have, you might have experienced God in a tangible way. You've walked away and you're like, wow, like God was really there today. I experienced his presence. Like I feel changed from the inside out. It's often at camps and conferences and we go, why well, wasn't... Why isn't Sundays like that? Why did I experience God like that at camp and conference, but why not on a Friday night? But here's the thing. It has nothing to do with where you are because wherever you are, He is. So here's the thing. When you go to camp, when you go to conference, what happens is you're not thinking about school. You're not thinking about uni. You're not thinking about what you're doing tomorrow. When you go to camp and conference, you have an expectation. And that expectation is an invitation to God to step in and do what only He can do. You see, your experience always comes through your expectation. If you're expecting tonight to be an average, mediocre Friday night, then guess what? You're going to leave this place with an average, mediocre Friday night. But, but, if you believe tonight, people are going to get set free. If you believe tonight, people are going to get healed. That depression will leave. That, that eating disorder is going to disappear. That people who are addicted to stuff will be set free. That relationships are going to be mended. If you expect that tonight, then God will step in and you will experience that tonight. The only thing holding us back tonight is ourselves. 
God's never holding back from you. All He wants to do is encounter you. And tonight, this is not a performance. I've been to so many performances. And do you know what happens when the power cuts? Everyone boos. Everyone throws things and everyone goes home. I've been at Calvin Harris, like one of the world's best DJs. But the moment the power went, everyone booed and everyone left. You know, but I also went to our summer camp two summers ago and the power went. Do you know what happened? The youth didn't leave. No one booed, no one threw anything. No, they just started singing from the top of their voice, from the bottom of their heart. They just singing praise to God. It went for five minutes, then it went for 10 minutes. No lights, no PA, no words, nothing. They just kept praising Him. 20 minutes, 30 minutes, 40 minutes, 50 minutes. We couldn't stop them. Why? Because they had just praised Him with Tehillah praise and they didn't care about anything else. Nothing was more attractive. Tribal wars, barbecue, fire, nothing. The party after, they didn't care about the after party. All they wanted to do was praise the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords because they had a revelation. This is not a performance. This is praise. And tonight, if you want to, we could see this place totally transformed. Why don't we stand to your feet? This isn't what I'm going to do. If you know that you want something changed in your life and you want to respond to this. As we sing this, I want to encourage you to come and stand down the front, just like Caleb said at the beginning. But this time, if you know you want to live your life and you want to praise Him, if you know you want to give your life to Him, if you know you want to see everything turned upside down and you just want to say, God, I'm not holding back with everything, I'm giving it to you. I want you to bowl in confidently, come and stand down the front here and we're going to see God do some amazing miracles tonight. Come on, stretch your hands to God right now. We're going to pray. We're going to pray for miracles. Heavenly Father, right now, I thank you for every single person standing here right now. I pray that you will take away the fear and you will fill them with faith. Father, we thank you that you are a rock, that you are a ranker, that you are the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. You are the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Father, today we give you everything and we pray that heaven will come to earth. May we know how to party. May we know how to celebrate. Lord, we give you the praise and we give you the glory. Come on, one more time. There's nothing like the presence of God. And there's no way that we could talk about how good and how great God is without giving people an opportunity to experience Him. Maybe you're here for the first time and you've never encountered the grace and the love of Jesus Christ. It'd be my greatest privilege and honor to lead you in a prayer so you could do just that. You see, when Jesus walked around, He invited everybody. And when He did so, He was so relevant. You see, the culture back there was all about seeds and trees, planting and farming, and he was so relevant to the day. But I'm aware that in Dudley, you guys aren't farmers. So allow me to explain to you what Jesus was all about during using technology. Right back in the beginning in the book of Genesis, God created humanity. And when we did so, we could talk to God all the time, 24-7, seven days a week. It was like having a phone with unlimited credit. But humanity turned their back on God, and in doing so, sin entered the world. Now sin is just S-I-N. It's all about that central letter. I, me, myself, selfishness. And that severed the connection between us and God. It was like someone turned on flight mode. It's like we went through a tunnel, we were disconnected. But God never wanted to be disconnected from us, for He created us to be in a relationship with us. So He made a way. He sent Jesus. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world, that He gave His one and only Son so that whoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Jesus came to reconnect us to the Father. But you know, even if you've got the best phone with the best camera, if you've been disconnected because you've you've not paid your bill, there's only one way to be reconnected, and that's by paying a price. For us to be reconnected to God, a price had to be paid. But I tell you what, this is why it's called the good news. Because God didn't make us pay it. No, He paid us for us. That's why Jesus went to the cross. On that cross, He took our sin, our shame, and our pain, past, present, and future, so that today we could have a relationship with Him. And on that cross, He died. But as we've already heard, He didn't stay dead because death could not hold Him down. Three days later, He rose again. He conquered the grave. And now because He is victorious, we get to stand here triumphant. What's it like, a relationship with Jesus? It's like downloading the latest software for your phone. The moment you do it, the old way is gone and the new way has arrived because of a change on the inside. What's it like following Jesus? The old is forgotten, your past is your past and your future is secure. A glorious future set forward with God in mind, everything sorted out. There's still problems ahead, but He is greater and He will help you through it. 
So if everyone could bow their heads and close their eyes right where you are. And I'll ask you, what is your response tonight? You can press dismiss and forget everything I've ever said. You can press remind me later and have a think about what the gospel means. Or if tonight you want to press install now. And by that I mean you want to enter into a relationship with Jesus Christ. Experience a love like no other love. A walk into that future that he's given for you. I'm going to count to three. And on three, all I want you to do is put one hand high in the air so I know who I'm praying for. And then we're going to pray together. A prayer which says tonight, I want to follow you, Jesus. So with every head bowed, every eye closed, this might be the very first time you're making this decision. Or maybe you've been in a relationship with God, but for some reason or another, you've fallen away. Know this, just because you might have turned your back on God, He never ever turned His back on you, and He's been pursuing you with His love every single day. And so maybe tonight, it's your coming home party. So on three, if you want to give your life to Christ, put one hand high in the air so I know who I'm praying for. One, two, three. Shoot them up. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Hands going up all over the place. Thank you, thank you. Up the back there, thank you. If there's anyone else in this last moment, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Hands going up all over this place. Amazing. All right, you can bring your hands down. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. There's so many of you. We're going to pray, and we're all going to pray out loud. Because like Caleb said, this is a family. And the family stands together in the good times and the hard times. But this is a good time. Because there's nothing in life like celebrating new life. So we're going to pray and we're going to pray out loud together. And then we're going to cheer and we're going to celebrate. And maybe we're even going to sing that one more time because I believe God always wants to do more. So come on, let's pray this together. Jesus, I thank you for what you did on the cross. So I can have a relationship with you. I thank you for your grace that covers all of my sin. Today, today, I have decided to give you my life. I have decided to give you my heart. Amen. Amen. Come on, why don't we have a shout? Why don't we have some celebration? Thanks for listening to this great message from our Unite event. We hope you'll stay connected with us online by following us on Instagram, Twitter and Facebook.